Hello, this is Hope, and you're listening to Covert Castaway. Welcome to my weekly diary of what I learn and how I cope with transitioning to life as a liveaboard cruiser. Now I understand why so many couples never actually make it onto the boat, even if they both start out really wanting to. In today's podcast, I want to talk about the changing power dynamics that happen when a couple is making the transition from land to boat living. The title of this podcast could have easily been, Do I Trust My Sailing Partner? Or, Will Sailing Ruin My Marriage? Or, What Are the Chances My DH Throws Me Overboard? In one of the first conversations we had with an accountant affiliated with our broker, he said, you know, most couples who sail together, they end up divorced. Nice. Not sure you saying that is helping you guys sell more boats, buddy. But I've given a lot of thought to his point. Let's be honest, ladies and gentlemen. Who runs the show at home now? Without getting into gender bias or pay inequity or any other sticky subjects, when it comes right down to it, who makes the decisions at home generally speaking. Now put your sailing hat on. You and your husband are on the boat. Who makes the decisions on the boat, generally speaking? And therein lies the central issue of the changing power dynamics for liveaboard cruising, generally speaking. My husband and I could be happy alone in a broom closet, playing cat's cradle with a piece of brown string. However, much like raising kids, boat things have a way of surfacing everyone's character defects. And we've definitely faced our share of challenges over the years. But this power dynamic thing going on, it's really baffling to navigate. I want to start with a quote by Mia on one of their podcasts on 59 North. When referring to how she and her husband do it, she says, it takes both gas and brakes to drive a car both fast and safe. I could 100% identify with that. And later when I sailed with them on Ice Bear, I got to witness firsthand exactly what she meant. When I first met my husband, I was enamored by how brave he was to do a double-handed race 14 days through the Pacific on a 24-foot boat. So when we started sailing together, I was the passenger, gleefully sipping my lemonade and adjusting my sun hat, blind to the 32 other things going on all at once. Over time, I started to understand the dangers involved, although he fooled me for a while with his calm demeanor and nerves of steel. To this day, I still get a little hot when he demonstrates his special talents with sail trim, and he's never once raised his voice on the boat. Ah, okay, where was I? Anyway, the more I learned, the more I realized how treacherous the ocean is. There's a reason people like land masses and snow skiing. So I started questioning him on all aspects of sailing and anything related to our future plans cruising, because a really awesome trait of a wife is to second guess your husband on something he has infinitely more experience about than you do. So what is going on here? I think there's a few forces at play that don't make for great dynamics through this transition. Risk tolerance. Let's start with this one. Some couples start out with the same level of experience sailing. For my husband and I, he was ahead of me when we first met. And he'd had many passages under his belt. He also started out by jumping on a boat and racing. Later we took courses together, but he went on to get offshore and RYA certified. Step one to not losing my marriage was not losing my husband while underway. So I wanted to learn everything I could about man overboard procedures because if I fall off, he will come and get me. But if he falls off, we both die. That was my main motivation to go through the classes to get bareboat certified. In an attempt to try to catch up, I spent a lot of time on sail theory and researching aspects of cruising that are really critical to our plans. I don't feel like I need to know everything he knows or that I need to be the skipper. I just want to be competent crew. I want to do my part in getting us set up for the cruising lifestyle and know what to do in an emergency. But as I said before, the more you start to learn about sailing, the scarier it is, and there are life or death mistakes that can be made. My problem is I've spent much of my life managing downside risk in everything I do. I have a backup plan for my backup plans for virtually every aspect of my life. It's just how I'm wired. It's not to say I'm not a joyful or optimistic person. I am. It's just that I like to know the absolute worst thing that could happen and then work my way backwards to make sure I'm avoiding the worst possible outcomes. It may stem from my family of origin issues around not having a strong father figure in my life, but that's too much information. As a result, I spend a ton of time trying to get smart on every topic under the sun. So I have a fact base I can wrap my head around. On some things, though, facts aren't clear. 
Something sailing or in living on a boat are just not straightforward. And depending on who you ask, you will get a thousand different opinions on the same topic. Let's take some obvious examples. Outrun a storm or heave to? Under what circumstances can you take paying guests? Where's the best place to flag a boat if you never intend to bring it back? Are lithium batteries safe? On land, there just seems to be a more established set of knowns that take a lot of ambiguity out of day-to-day decisions. That just doesn't exist in the boat world. So I end up spending a lot of brain power worrying about things or decisions I see as pretty important, and I often want to draw conclusions or make decisions based on minimizing risk, not assuming naturally that the best outcome will happen. Why do I do this? Because I'm a woman. I have firsthand experience with this in my career as well. I see the differences between men and women, and there are studies done on it. Women feel like they need to know everything before they're confident to take on a new role, where men just assume they can do it and act confident so they get the job. So that part is on me. As for my husband, in addition to looking at things as a natural progression, he doesn't think about risk the same way. He's an ultra optimist. He wants to plan for the best outcome and then deal with the curveballs as they happen. The consequence of his thinking is in me, it triggers concern that he's being too Pollyanna about his expectations and it makes me question his judgment, which is not healthy for a marriage, like at all. From his perspective, he's more comfortable being more optimistic because he's more confident based on his experience. So while I'm forming biases based on my knowledge of what could go wrong, he's basing his bias on his experience and confidence that things will go right and his confidence in our ability to handle a setback or an unforeseen problem. This is a dilemma, and I've done a fair amount of introspection on what my part of the conflict is. Part of my problem is I have super bionic radar intuition. I notice everything. It's a special talent of mine. It's done me really well in some areas, but can make people around me totally crazy. It makes me crazy. My head is a very noisy place. I pick up on disconnected concepts or physical things, and my brain will form a relationship and play out scenarios for what's going to happen. Sometimes this is conscious, sometimes it's subconscious, and I just get a feeling. But then after the fact, I can see the signs existed all along. I joke to people that my headstone's going to say, I told you so. But for my husband... He doesn't see things this way at all, so he thinks I'm jumping to irrational conclusions. Which brings me to the next dynamic, difference in the way we solve problems. Being with someone who solves problems differently is something I value. If we both look at the same problem the exact same way, we run the risk of coming to the wrong answer together. I would rather have healthy tension to get a better answer than not. That being said, the problem-solving process does create conflict. My husband tends to use inductive reasoning gathering a lot of facts, then coming to a conclusion. I tend to use abductive reasoning, taking a couple of facts and forming a conclusion, then I pressure test that conclusion nine ways to Sunday. There are flaws to both approaches. In his approach, he spends a lot more time researching topics than I do. I just don't have the patience for it. In my approach, I can go in circles pressure testing my conclusion and second guessing myself. When we effectively combine these methods together, the answer is usually better, but the journey is oh so painful. See, he perceives me coming to my initial conclusions as my answer, not what it is, part of my problem-solving process. We're working through this. It's a journey. Another dynamic is role confusion in blue, pink, or purple jobs. A lot of people use those terms in their households, and I think the same exists on a boat. Our roles are changing, and it's confusing. My rule at home is that I generally take care of a thousand details that my husband may not see. I don't think this is much different for me than many other women. I'm one of those people that runs a household. It's sort of what we do as wives and mothers. We take care of things, pink jobs. So in the world of a man, life just seems to miraculously run smoothly. Then we tend to make our honey-do list and ask them for help when we need it, usually around manly things like yard work, home repairs, or lifting heavy things, blue jobs. With planning this transition, we decided it was important for both of us to know things, create redundancy, and also, in a crisis or a situation, we would know enough to be able to anticipate better what needs to be done, to be on the same page. Now, there's no such things as blue and pink jobs. Everything is sort of purple. So who's accountable for what now? I think it would be different if I made the decision to say, honey, you be in charge of sailing things and I'll be in charge of living on boat things. But that's not what we have decided to do as a couple. For us, we want to create some redundancy, which causes tension. My husband and I also have very, very different perspectives on time. 
In an earlier podcast, I mentioned my husband's indifference to time. It gives him the freedom to enjoy his life by being in the present with episodes of what I'll refer to as rush crisis. While I am held hostage to time, my day is scheduled into 30-minute increments where the goal is to get as many things done and be organized. The downside is that I have no ability to live in the present moment. Insert boat plan. And now we have 10,000 things to figure out in a short period of time, each one of which takes time to research, talk to people about, get advice on, etc., and so on. There just isn't enough time for us to get everything done if we have to collaborate on every single decision. At least that's my opinion. I want to make a list, spend the necessary amount of time on a topic that's equivalent to how important the decision is, make a decision, and move on to the next thing. He wants to spend the time it takes necessary to make a good decision, to do it right. But I'm a done is better than perfect kind of a gal, so there you go. What I've come to appreciate is that on land, I'm the gas and he's the brakes. He's French. And like turkey on Thanksgiving Day or waiting for your boat to be commissioned, he's ready when he's ready. Also, he's an engineer, so he's more methodical about certain things, where I'm more of a take charge, get it done person. Read, impatient. And I'm highly intuitive. Read, I make stuff up as I go along. On water, our roles are sort of reverse. So he's the gas and I'm the brakes. So this is when I started second guessing everything in my neurotic desire to keep myself alive. But hey, I'm not for everyone. What I came to realize is he's not the one who I can't trust. I'm the one that he can't trust if we both aren't on the same page. Making a transition to live aboard sailing gives us the opportunity to work through all of our most personal relationship baggage ahead of time, or we can wait for real time shouting over the wind in a packed anchorage. For this, I think it comes down to really knowing what matters. The worst possible situation isn't fighting over someone's crappy anchoring techniques. It's whether or not we can work together in a high-stress, time-sensitive situation and have a very clear idea about who's calling the shots. And I know I am at risk for mutinous behavior, so I've got to watch it. So what we started to do is put together an agreed-upon risk management strategy. We made a list of top things that could go wrong and ranked them in order of how big a deal it is. Then we also ranked them by likelihood of it happening. Then we multiplied the numbers together and got a risk ranking of scenarios that we both agreed upon. This is sort of a standard approach to risk management generally, so we just applied it. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually a thing. What's at the top of the list in the end were those things that really matter on a boat that actually might happen. Everything else goes into pick your battles territory. Our approach is to start at the top of the list and talk through each scenario and agree to either the procedure, the possible course of action, or what would be required in that situation. Then we either have to learn it, practice it, pack it, or laminate it and put in a binder. I truly believe that having this down and having this perspective will make it much easier to work through these top priority problems in a high stress situation. And for the other things, I need to ask myself in the heat of an argument, does it really matter? And do I need to be right? Sure, my husband will be the skipper and in a situation, I will follow orders. Also, he has a higher risk tolerance because he also has more experience. But it's both of us together on the boat, and we have to make decisions based on our combined limitations as a team, right? Well, not always. Together, we can practice, prepare, agree on procedures, agree on how to make passage decisions, and work on better communication. But in the end, the boat can only have one captain. And this is something I am in control of, because on land, I've been the captain. Now I need to work on being better crew. So the lesson for me in all this is to plan for the worst possible scenario and have a game plan ahead of time together so you know your limits as a team and know who's in charge when things go sideways. But maybe more importantly is to take this transition time as a way to reflect on what I need to do to be a better person and a better crew member, which also translates into me being a better life partner if you really stop and think about it. I can definitely understand why liverboard sailing could be hard on couples. I'm actually grateful we have this opportunity in front of us to learn and grow together, and I'm glad I'm going in with eyes wide open with a partner that wants to evolve as a team. For me personally, my biggest periods of growth have started with self-awareness of my character defects or things that maybe worked for me in the past that won't work for me in the future. Then make an earnest effort to improve or do things differently. I think the reason we want to take on sailing is to push ourselves to be better, and for me, I am anticipating life-altering experience. The whole idea is to learn how to improve both my capabilities and my character. The ocean is like one massive mirror. 
It has a way of showing us exactly, truly, and honestly who we are. What about you? What power dynamics are you experiencing with your spouse and how are you working through it? Visit the Covert Castaway Facebook page and join the conversation. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, or share with another Covert Castaway. Fair winds for now. Oh, 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 oh